thought we'd get started because Satiria and I are between you and probably dinner and uh, we need to have small meetings. Um, my name is Tina Kator, I'm from Ayarnak, I'm Chief Commercial Officer of the company and I've been with the company for about a year. I'd like to start off by thanking the IAC uh, for bringing me back to the MLS. Uh, I lived here for about three years before I joined my arm, so I'm super excited to be back here in Dubai. Um, to my left here is Satiria. She's uh, our new rock star at the company. She's our uh, brains behind many of our optical communication terminals, and she's our solutions engineer. So uh, we're both here for the entire week. Um, so my goal today is to give you kind of an overview of what uh, the world of laser communications or optical communications, both of those terms are used interchangeably. So I'm gonna give you a very kind of high level overview of why now, why are people talking about laser communications now uh, since the technology has been around um, a long time. And so Terry will sort of run through the technical aspects of it, kind of still keeping it at a high level. Um, we are here the entire week uh, we're part of the German Pavilion, uh, we are a German company, so please feel free to stop by our booth and we can kind of have a uh, more deeper discussion around it. So, laser communications is not new. It's been around, as I say, for a long time. I personally have worked on um, incorporating laser communication capabilities um, on satellites over two decades ago, and it's always been viewed um, in the past as this sort of um, boutique technology that people are looking to deploy on sort of demonstrator missions, science missions, etc. Um, so what we're trying to do at MyARIC is really get this technology into products that are scalable and deployed out there. So one of our, our, our key uh, challenges, uh, but also opportunities, is to really get you all aware of this technology as a product have you adopted it in the different markets um, that we're, we're looking at. Um, so at MyARIC, we are a product-focused company. We develop laser communications products for the space market, Leo, Leo. We are going into the airborne side of things, the mobility platforms, um, UAVs, uh, platforms that are moving around uh, high altitude. Uh, we're also looking at how to bring that data back to the ground. So space to ground is also a product um, arena that we're looking at. So um, really kind of connecting the dots and hopefully this presentation will give you a high level overview of what's actually happening. So just to bring everybody on the same page, many of you are scientists here, I'm an engineer, so I'll try to bring everybody up to the, to the same level. So optical communications, what is that? It's essentially the use of light and the means of trans, um, transferring information how we're doing that is we're using laser. And in the context of the space environment, optical communication technology sends large chunks of um, uh, data um, using light and lasers. Um, and this is an alternative to RF. Radio frequency is something we're all very familiar with. Um, it has, you know, it operates in various spectrums, etc. cetera. Um, so I believe that from an uh, optical comms perspective, these are technologies that can coexist. They each have pros and cons, depending on the environment that you're planning on deploying these um, capabilities. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about moving data via light. It has some unique technical capabilities. I'm just gonna let you soak this um, image. We're all familiar with the various um, technologies. You know, you've got the Wi-Fi, you've got E-band, B-band, Q, Okay, you band, and these are sort of all the RF type technologies that have been talked about. You can see where optical laser communication really adds value to what we're trying to do, which is move large chunks of data between two objects, be it satellites, etc. So it's a point to point uh, technology. So when you're looking at high throughput data, this is the true value of laser communication or optical communication. You'll hear me interchange that terminology quite often. Uh, this is what people do out there. So optical comms is when you're looking at gigabits, you know, whether it's tens or hundreds, and that's the kind of links that you're trying to establish, this is where the really real value comes into play. And across longer ranges. 
At our company, we're deploying, as I said, into the space market. We have terminals that we've deployed in our LEO um, orbit. We have a terminal that we're developing for the MEO orbit for a specific application. Um, we have airborne platforms. And the idea is to connect the dots. So the why. As I've been alluding to, high-speed, high-throughput data communication is where the true value of laser comm comes into play. The other aspect is, if you think of what a laser comm product is, it's made up of essentially um, a telescope, which is, think of it in the RF world as your receive and transmit antenna. And then you have an electronics box, which has a laser Ethernet transceiver, some um, amplifiers, etc. And if you want to keep it really simple, think of it as your modem. So you need these two components to establish um, a link. So, so what you're doing there is you're transferring light by a laser beam. I don't think I have a laser pen here, but it's not going to be visible. You really are looking at driving a point-to-point -point link. It's a narrow view link. Think of a flashlight, right? If I had a large flashlight, that would be what an RF signal looks like. It's diverging quite wide. If you're diverging quite wide, you have a larger area of interception. If you look at the laser beam, it's very pointed, right? Right there on that wall, you can see me pointing. It's a very narrow beam, and we point it there. It's, it's the only way I'm going to be able to jam that is, or actually disrupt it is to get in the way of it, right? So the security aspect of laser comp is very valuable to all of us. The other aspect that I want you all to think about and be aware of is the RF spectrum, as we know, is very scarce. It's regulated heavily. Everyone's jockeying around for how do we, how do we use it. Um, from a laser uh, call perspective, this is a license-free technology, right? So your time to market is so much um, faster. You're not having to negotiate and sharing uh, spectrum or talking to people about um, you know, sharing the spectrum or use of it or landing rights. These are all things that can really help with your go-to-market strategies. Um, as a satellite operator, as a new space company that's wanting to deploy um, things out there. So one of the things that's happening right now is, you know, why why are people talking about laser comm today as opposed to, you know, 20 years ago? Uh, personally, I believe the time for laser comm is now because the technology has already been proven. But the challenge is lie in perfecting the performance. Making sure that these products are manufacturable at scale, that's clearly something we're focused on, and actually to make it affordable. So those three parameters, performance, manufacturability, affordability is something that we're focused on. But we also believe that terminals that we produce or our competitors produce need to be interoperable. How are those terminals going to be interoperable? We have to have some type of standard that you're going to communicate by. So we've been very fortunate that we've been working very actively um, with the Space Development Agency um, in the United States, which is actually really spearheading the standard development, what I call it, their optical communication terminal standard. So we've been involved very actively in helping shape that standard so our terminal can talk to somebody else's terminal. And these are types of things that are going to evolve, standards are going to evolve, and why does it make sense to do that? Well, when you have a constellation, say a government constellation that's deployed these products into space, that now wants to talk to an Earth observation constellation from a commercial company, and you want to move large quantities of data, the optical comm terminal, standards compliant terminal, is going to give you that ability to do that. So we've been really focused on spearheading that effort, evangelizing that effort, and now we're going to start seeing the deployment of these terminals by end of 2022, 2023 into the market. So in the next couple of years, you really are going to see the adoption of this technology as products into the market. So the future of laser comp products, as I alluded to, is really connecting this architecture. It's a hybrid architecture. It's basically connecting space to air to ground to in between. So, so that, that would be the real value proposition, right? right? To be able to get this architecture going for commercial use cases, for government use cases, for the different markets that I can't even think through. 
So again, you've got the high-speed data that connects these platforms that are moving. You've got the long distances. The low probability of detection, it's obvious, right? I mentioned that RF beam is really spreading wide. So if you think of a space-to-ground link by a laser pump, think of it as a very narrow beam pointing directly down to an optical ground terminal. You do that in the RF, it could light off a significant perimeter around your ground station, and for defense applications, that could be a problem. So this kind of technology really helps connect these nodes very well. So what are the key drivers? These hybrid architectures, so Terry will talk to you a little bit about how we're connecting the different markets. Interoperability, I've just spoken to you about. It's really key for us. Um, as I say, we're deploying products in Leo and in Neo. And you know, you've got, you've been hearing about um, you know, various data relay services that um, are taking the data from Leo into Neo and then back into ground. So interoperability is really key. Product companies need to adopt these standards. We are very pro the standard. And this is going to, if you're a satellite bus manufacturer, Product companies like us are talking to you early enough so you know that you can accommodate um, the, not just the product, but accommodate the standards, the communication, the power needs that we have. What is driving all this? The sheer thirst for high throughput bandwidth in all applications. We have dialogue with a lot of SAR companies that are taking so many great imagery, but they just cannot move that imagery down fast enough. It's too expensive, the pipe is too narrow, it's not secure. So this is kind of where the real value of laser comp comes into play. And so Terry will talk to you about some of the, the advances we're making on this gigabit speeds that we're able to uh, accomplish, and actually talk to you about even beyond that, what our roadmap looks like. So as I mentioned, there are a lot of data in space that they need a fast and reliable way to be transferred. Uh, satellites in Leo, Mio, and Dio orbit, um, like Earth observation satellites, mega constellations, uh, communication satellites, military networks, they can benefit by an optical network. So they can transfer the data by one orbit to another, or if they're on the same orbit, orbit but in another orbit of play, uh, using la later intersatellite links to transfer really fast their, uh, their data between um, the satellites. So minority of deploying space terminals for different orbits, and these terminals, they are designed to have a maximum efficiency. Uh, they can reach ranges over 8,000 uh, kilometers in Leo orbits, 35,000 kilometers in Mio orbits, uh, with super um, low power requirements, and they are compatible with high data rates of 10 G and 100 G. You can even reach higher ranges if you change the detection technology or you increase uh, your optical power, decrease your data rate requirements to a few gigabits. They are also uh, designed to provide a low latency, and that is actually coming naturally because the light is moving into a vacuum. So they can enable technologies that they require this low latency um, to be successful. Our counter terminal, the terminal for the space, is also uh, a high modular, it has a highly modular design. It has a wide acquisition uh, field of view. And why is this helpful? Because the beam is so narrow that if you really want to acquire and do a fast acquisition in, in a single digit number of seconds um, in order not to lose or have to buffer your data. It also has a hyperhemispheric field of regard, so it can really serve different missions. It can look all the way up to the elevation and to the azimuth angle to connect the satellite with different orbits, other planes, and even uh, if they're moving um, fast into the space. They also have state-of-the-art super sensitive receivers, and this is, this is the key to actually uh, have low power requirements and enable the, uh, the high data rates. 
The space terminals, they are also designed with maximum reliability because being something reliable in space is super important. Uh, so the terminal has to, has to be able to withstand the thermal vibration, shock environment that it's going to operate, and of course the radiation environment. So the terminals, they have to be designed to operate in a LEO orbit that is all estimated in, um, uh, when we are talking about radiation, up to DO, MEO, DO orbits and beyond. So they, they, this is also important because you need to support missions that they are not one or two years. There are missions that they can last 10 or 15 or many years and you have to be able to, to have a reliable terminal. So what I'm going to talk about now is the acquisition. The acquisition of um, the terminal is really important, and that's because imagine you have to point a really, really narrow beam to another counter terminal which is thousands of kilometers away, and this is challenging. So what are we doing? We we are uh, having a line source that. We send some laser out, we are receiving some laser, and there's some magic happening in between. So when I say there's a magic happening in between, in order to start the high data communication, you need to find the other terminal. The terminals, they have a course pointing assembly, so they have a moving part, a gimbal, a optical mechanical um, part. They also have mirrors, faster mirrors, lenses, and they all control by an electronic uh, by an electronic device that is actually steering the beam and controls all these components. So how it is working? You have to have an idea of where is the other terminal. So this idea uh, is coming from the satellite bus, which is giving us some TMDC information, a few minutes data about the trajectory of the terminal that we are targeting to communicate. So. But that's, that's not enough, because that, that contains errors. So we have an uncertainty area. And what the terminal can do with the wide field of with the field of view that we have, the wide field of view that we have, is they can kind of see and start scan this area. And the counter terminal has its detector. So when it starts detecting uh, this light, they start aligning each other. And this can happen really fast, in a matter of seconds. So when this is completely completed, then you can start the high throughput communication between the terminals. And I also have an animation here to kind of show you how dynamic an environment can be uh, for a laser communication terminal. So you have um, terminals that are moving in high speeds. At the same time, they have to acquire each other. They have to keep the connection. And in any sense, the operator might want to change the conos and uh, connect with uh, another plane or another orbit or do you know different things. And the terminals they have to have the ability to acquire and start transmitting data as fast as possible. And this is something that uh, we are taking seriously into consideration into our design. But Manaric is not only doing that. We are also looking into the future. We, we want to enable ultra-fast communications. And we are talking about communications of terabytes. So this can be enabled by having coherent systems, so not direct detection systems. You know, on a flight, you have, you're deploying other technologies that they can bring you to 100Z or division multiplexing. Um, etc. And you also want to have a secure communication. So an optical link can also be used to transmit uh, a quantum a quantum key or um, yeah, yeah, enable you to, to use uh, this technology for these kind of applications. And we're, we don't stop innovating, we don't stop uh, redesigning our terminals and bringing it to the market even smaller and more powerful uh, terminals. A little overview of our products. So, thank you, Sophia. So, as Sophia mentioned, we, we all had a, a little quick overview about what is laser called an optical pulse. And she's kind of giving you a very simple way to view it in terms of how you acquire a link, how you do a detection, how you do a data transfer. 
And this is something that we're doing today. We can simulate these environments on the ground. We have the test bed capabilities both in our Munich headquarters and in California, in Hawthorne, that's where we're located. Um, so the problems of today are important. As I mentioned earlier, we've spent well over a decade as a company proving out use cases, doing one-off missions, testing things out. But the key for all of us who are working on laser pump products is to get them out into the industry so they get adopted. So at Minaric, we have a suite of uh, product families. We really are focused on our Condor family of terminals, which are targeted to the space market. Our Hawk family of terminals, targeted to sort of the airborne mobility markets. And we are looking at optical ground, both from a fixed standpoint and from a mobility vehicle perspective. So these are the products that are in our roadmap today, different versions, different data speeds, and we really want to work with, with you, the customer, you, the partner, to get these technologies deployed out there. We have mock-ups of our terminals at our booth at the German Pavilion, so please do stop by. Um, we're happy to take questions at our booth. I know, as I said, we had 30 minutes to do this very quickly, but if you reach out to the two of us and our colleagues at the booth, we're happy to take your questions. Thank you very much for listening to all the both of us. Thank you. Thank you.
the super sensitive receivers that we have. And when I want to talk about sensitivity, I mean that you need less power to close the communication link. Um, when, when you don't have this receiver, you will need to transmit more power uh, to, to reach your receive aperture in order to, to have a stable and high throughput connection. Please go ahead. Very good question. Ta the size of satellites. So right now we're focused in the market to deploy on, I would say, small SAS, right? So up to about 200, well, the bigger the better for us, right? So we can put more terminals on. Um, there are others out there that have CubeSat laser pump terminals. Um, you have to look at what the power needs of the terminal are. As Sateria mentioned, you know, we, we're looking at a very hyper-hemispherical view, so we're looking up, we're looking down, and things flying very fast. But if your mission as a CubeSat mission is to just move data into one direction, you absolutely can incorporate a laser pump uh, payload, but obviously small payload. Very good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, thank you for the question. question. So, so we have um, at least two aircraft flying around right now. Um, one in Germany. Um, I can't say it. Over half the half. Somebody help me. <laughs> Airport near Gilkey. Anyway, we're, we've got an ultralight aircraft that's flying around um, or doing this demonstration, and we're, we're seeing 10 gigabit per second links. No point in age acquisition is is already there on. A, a vehicle that's moving, and we've also tried it um, on a fixed vehicle. Um, we have the same kind of demonstration going on high altitude um, aircraft as well, um, and we're, we're, we're experiencing really good uh, data rates. We haven't had any link disruptions. Um, so those are the kinds of things that the technology is proven. Right, as you say, you've got the damp, the, the vibration environments in space. Uh, I would actually love to invite you to come by our booth to kind of show you uh, how our whole kernel, the, the terminal that is designed for the aircraft is, because you can see that even in a high vibration environment, when you slow it into a spacecraft, a defense spacecraft that is moving, you know, uh, super fast, because of the hyperhemispherical field of view, you can kind of point the laser super fast to keep the closed loop tracking. And then there are also fast tuning mirrors that they also compensate for um, some part of the vibration. But again, I mean, if you have severe vibrations or you lose track, you might lose uh, the link, but the reacquisition happens super fast because one terminal knows where the other terminal is, so they can point and reestablish the link and you don't have to, you know, um, deal with uh, buffering or things like that. Or, or you can fall back to, to an alternative network. This is also possible uh, using our terminals. And what's really interesting is our Hawk product line of terminals were developed for air air comms. Right now we're doing tests of about 40 kilometer range, two very fast moving aircraft. Our goal, and that's at 10 gigabit per second. What we're hoping by the end of this year is to accomplish 10 gigabit at 100 kilometers. Um, and then, you know, we have some requirements from various um, customers uh, to get a variable data rate, but a higher range. So the technology has a real use case. Um, it, for us, it's just we're a product company. We're looking for system integrators. We know the platforms very well, so we're integrating with those companies. So we already have many of these demonstrations, not as um, uh, demonstration terminals. These are our production terminals that are in the customer's hands to do these demonstrations. Please. Uh, so we are a mechanism, please correct me if I'm wrong, we are a mechanism of delivery of the keys. Quantum communication for us is just, we don't see the data, we're just moving the data. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're calling our system a transparent system. Of course, you need to, to have some technology into the system, right, to, to support that, um, and to detect, you know, the fault and the kind of uh, transmission of that. But, but uh, yes, we, we are having it through our both of us. Mm -hmm. 
so the question is, do we foresee um, uh, laser pump used for you know, deep space missions, lunar missions, etc.? It has been something for the last two months. We have been inundated with requests for either laser comm terminals for a constellation around the moon or for probes going into deep space. Um, absolutely feasible, absolutely um, beneficial. Um, so there are some specific companies that are good at that. One-off missions doing doing those things, and uh, you know, you, the further you go, you know, you're detecting the light. The data rate might they might not be gigabit per second at tens of hundreds. Yeah, down to the earth, no, but you can always use Hundreds of kilograms. So I mean, we, we are open to, to discuss this as well. Uh, at this time, we don't have a product line for that, but we can. Uh, we are open to to get into this discussion. So there are companies out there, commercial companies. Um, for example, in the United States, SpaceLink is looking at deploying a uh, data relay service in the Leo orbit, on which they're going to deploy our terminals. And they're going to be talking to Leo, and they're going to be talking to others. There's a startup out of Japan right now that's looking at deploying a similar data relay service that's looking at uh, how they would use it for Leo missions, deep space missions. So the market is really evolving in terms of adopting this for various different markets. Very good it's question. Sure, it's, it's, never it's, never question. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first question we both get. Um, my answer is always mute the clouds, stick a bunch of power in it. <laughs> she has a better answer. <laughs> so, it's so, I mean, if you have a cloudy day, you might uh, lose your link because, um, I mean, the, the laser cannot always go through the clouds. It really depends, though, on like the technology that we're using, etc. So that's why when you're deploying a ground station network, you have to have some diversity, right? To make sure that uh, you can set your signals uh, somewhere else. But this is the this is the magic of um, inter-satellite links and generally this technology, that you can route your signal through different ways. So you can, like, okay, I have like a cloud interruption here, so I'm gonna send it somewhere else, but it's sunny and nice, and I'm gonna dump the data there down. So, a single cloud going through a lake is not an issue. We've had birds flying through lakes. All of those kinds of things are not an issue. What is a rainy day, a full on cloud cover, yes, you're going to experience that. But as Saturia said, you know, the whole point of optical cloud terminals, you want to deploy them as into satellite links. You put two of those in plane, you put four of those, you can do a cross plane communication. And if you want to bring your data down and you have ISLs on board, you can bring them down in a location of a term, uh, ground station, which generally is in a nice place. Yeah, and there are all too much cloud cover. Yeah. Yeah. And there are always coding uh, techniques that you can use to, to overcome uh, some of the penetration, right? Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. We are waiting you by our book. Yeah.